Darkness flowed around me. I felt suspended in the air, weightless, as plumes of smoke swirled lazily in front of me. Suddenly a flat oval-shaped object emerged from the smoke, drifting silently towards me. It spun gracefully, coming to a halt right before my eyes. As I watched, I could see reflections of the swirling smoke shimmer off its surface. But the being at its center was alien to me. It resembled an Illyrian, yet it was cloaked in pitch-black feathers and adorned with bulging muscles. It looked straight at me with its glistening black pearl eyes, a trace of fear apparent in its gaze. In a moment of surreal connection, I raised my hand. Mirroring my motion with eerie precision, it raised its hand as well. Suddenly, a metallic voice chimed in all around me. Uplink established injecting stimulants, it announced in an even tone. I felt a sharp prickle in my right upper arm and suddenly a blinding light flashed in my face. I blinked a few times as I was starting to see shapes around me. I was in a spacious room. Metallic walls covered each side with instruments of medical science draped on them. Some sort of a machine was to my right that was connected to an IV on my forearm. I rubbed my eyes as I heard a voice coming from my left. Welcome back, Gray said in a soft voice. I looked at him and he wore a warm smile. I clapped my beak in return as a friendly gesture, but quickly glanced down at my arms and torso. I still had my color and I didn't look like I had gained an ungodly amount of muscle. I breathed a sigh of relief as I looked normal. But as I looked closer, I saw some sort of a small metallic plate on my left forearm. Gray seemed to notice. That is the connector to your neural uplink in your brain, he said in a calm voice. I placed my hand to the back of my head and felt a small metallic hexagon shape stuck there. Well, I am mostly intact, I thought, my mind feeling a bit fuzzy as I touched it. The doors at the end of the room slid open and a tanned Terran in a white coat walked in. He had brown hair that was combed back and wore red-tinted circular glasses. Ah, uh, Mr. Zelios, glad to see you. I am Dr. Ethan Thompson, he said as he strutted up to the foot of my medical bed. He examined me with peering eyes for a few seconds, then looked over a handheld tablet. Looks like the implant procedure was successful and your body accepted the new changes without a hitch. No rejection from either the implant or the nanodrones found. He continued with a satisfied smile. That's right. I was sedated after I entered the lab with Gray. How long have I been asleep? I asked sheepishly. Approximately two hours and twenty-three minutes. The procedure took roughly forty minutes after you went asleep and the rest was observing the aftermath. After it was confirmed that the implants had integrated well enough, you were given a stimulant to wake up, he said as he skimmed his tablet again. What do you mean, well enough? I asked, concern dripping slowly over me. Well, since time is of the essence, we had to rush things. You are not fully integrated with the implants and might have some minor side effects when you connect your COTAD device, he said hesitantly. Anything bad we need to worry about? asked Gray with a concerned expression. Nothing substantial, minor headaches, dizziness, and the occasional multitognitive episode. Dr. Ethan answered back in a professional tone. What does multitognitive mean? I asked as that word sounded alien to me and my translator could not dissect it. It means you could experience having multiple thoughts simultaneously. AI have the capability to do so effortlessly, but to a brain made of flesh, it is a daunting experience and you could feel overwhelmed, he explained as he fixed his glasses. Wow, the thought of that sounds scary, I said as I mulled over the possibility of that happening. Not to worry. The nanodrones in your brain will help in that endeavor, should it happen. They function to keep your mind calm and sharp, and even though you were fully integrated, you would still have some symptoms when you link up. He continued in high spirits. Now you rest a bit longer and Captain Gray will escort you. To get your cotad. I would like to accompany you, but I have other matters to attend to. Dr. Ethan finished as he said his farewells and left the room. I sat in the room with Gray for a moment thinking about all the moments that led me here, and I felt unnaturally calm about it, probably the nanobots doing their work. Gray, I spoke in a calm tone, not caring for ranks anymore between us as I considered him now as a comrade. Yes, Zelios, he said in return with a smile as he seemed to like the fact that I asked him directly. Why are you the Terrans so advanced? What reason did your species have to make all the things I have witnessed here? 
I finally asked after a good pause. Gray's face became stern, and he was quiet for a good while. It's not a complex story. It was born mostly out of fear after a traumatic event in our history, he finally said as he took a deep breath. Do you wish for me to tell you? he asked. If it's not too troublesome for you and my feet are still a bit numb, I responded, which made him chuckle. All right. Since the dawn of our species figuring out how to sharpen sticks into weapons and control fire, we had no natural enemy, besides ourselves. The only thing that threatened us were ourselves. And over 12,000 years, we have fought each other over everything, from resources to religious beliefs. 350 years ago, that changed. We had started expanding outside our own star system. We had colonized our neighboring system called Alpha Centauri. Terran society was still splintered into countries at that time, and they were constantly at each other's throats. Then we had our first encounter with aliens, he explained, the air feeling heavy as my brain was taking in the information. That is a lot of time to dedicate to warfare. Even my species had our own unification wars, but 12,000 years is a long time. I'm surprised you didn't destroy yourselves in the process. But wait, I thought we were the first alien race you spoke to, I said back in response. Yes, we have almost wiped ourselves out a few times in our history, and we technically count the Illyrians as our first interstellar species contact since the aliens we encountered 350 years ago were not sentient. They were filthy beasts, he said with the last part leaving him with a look of cold fury. The first contact we had with the beasts we aptly named the Bellum was hostile to say the least. They were a race similar in looks to us, but were blue, had four arms, flat noses, and were three meters tall of lanky muscle. They came in a gargantuan ship 15 kilometers long over our cradle world, seemingly out of thin air. There were no words of warning or hails of greeting. They just simply opened fire upon us. A billion died, and then they invaded with landing crafts. They hunted us not like animals. They didn't take trophies. They simply enjoyed killing for the sake of it. Thankfully, we had hundreds of nuclear warheads stashed on the moon, and we launched all of them. Most of them were shot down, but a few hit the ship which broke their shields and made it collapse to the surface of Terra. My ancestors hunted down the remnants of them with burning hatred, killing every single one of them. Then they disassembled the massive ship learning everything they could from it down to its last bolt. Their society was advanced, more than we could have fathomed, but they were a genocidal race, and they tore themselves apart. We figured out that the ship that arrived at our planet and the individuals on there were the last remnants of their once vast empire, and they were simply looking for a place to die out doing what they loved, he explained. I was taken aback by what he said. The pain the Terrans felt back then must have been immense, and their mistrust of other sentient races would have been rooted deep. Through the reverse engineering of their tech and then improving upon it, our species catapulted hundreds of years forward in technological advancements. From this traumatic event, we also united under one banner of the Terran Federation. We created a common language and started focusing on improving our infrastructure and military. Then we created our first AI, aptly named Odin, with his help, we advanced even further and at an unprecedented pace. With new FTL travel, we spread across the stars, colonizing star systems at blistering speed, and at one point, Odin, along with a brilliant scientist, wanted to create a military branch whose purpose was to be secret, lethal operatives working behind enemy lines. And that is how the Umbra Vanguard was. Born. He finished with a satisfied huff. That was a heavy story to digest, but now it made sense why they are this advanced, and why their military is so potent. It was born as a necessity to never experience the same tragedy again. I remember that when our civilization's first contact happened. Your representatives didn't seem distrusting or hostile. I would have expected a not-so-warm welcome considering what happened in your past. And yet you were the most welcoming of beings, bringing gifts and charming us wholeheartedly. I said, thinking back on the live broadcast I watched of the event. The Umbra had already been surveilling your species for months before the first contact happened, Gray commented back. My eyes went wide as I turned to stare at him. He wore a sad expression on his face as he continued. The Illyrians were the first sentient species we had encountered after the Bellum. 
and we wanted to be careful, but as we learned more about your race, the more we liked you. We established the first contact with you, and I believe I can speak for most of my species when I say that we have not regretted forming a relationship with yours, he finally said with a smile. But that is enough of that now, let's get going, shall we? He asked in a friendly manner as he stretched out a hand to help me out of the bed. I nodded as I grabbed his hand and hoisted myself up, and the IV disconnected as my feet touched the cold floor. I got handed clothes that were specially made for me. They were in shades of gray and black, which went surprisingly well with my feather tone. There was an insignia on the left shoulder of an Illyrian in flight with four stars above it, which was supposed to symbolize my rank in the new militia, and on the right was a symbol of a black specter with blue eyes. We headed out of the room and into the hallway. I met some people on the way, both workers and soldiers, who all greeted me with a salute. I greeted back with a salute then looked up at Gray with a questioning look. He looked back with a smile. You bear an insignia that represents your rank now within the Umbra Vanguard, and they are saluting you, Commander, he whispered with a chuckle. I felt stiff as I responded to the people we met on the way to our new location. We entered a new tram that led us to what I assumed was the military quarters, since the amount of soldiers we met on the way was increasing substantially. After a bit of walking, I was proven right, we stood in front of the armory. Gray placed his hand on a terminal that was next to the door, and it split open with a mighty hiss. We walked in, and my senses were bombarded with a plethora of information. All around me in a massive space were machinery and workers tinkering away on vehicles, weaponry, and other things I could not make heads or tails of. There were loud sounds of welding and clanging of metal. Oil and other chemicals tinged the air, which made me momentarily flinch. Gray asked a personnel staff a few questions I could not hear, and we were off to a secluded section of the armory. We entered a small room, and before me on a table were two tactical-looking gloves and a tablet that looked almost identical to the coat Tad Gray wore on his wrist but a bit smaller. I walked up to the table, and Gray told me to put on the gloves first. I did so, and they fit well, almost up to my elbow. Then there was a patch open on my left glove where the metal plate on my forearm fit perfectly within. I took the device off the table and it clicked in place on my left arm, almost seeming to be magnetically locked on there. A moment passed before the device turned on and on the screen. In Alarian stood connecting to neural link, and a blue loading bar below it zoomed from left to right. Connection established, came a voice in my head. Moments later, a mountain of information flowed into my head. I felt dizzy as I grasped at the table to hold myself upright as my legs felt like they would fail me. Information about the Terrans flowed like a river. Their history, culture, military tactics, vehicles, and weapons, and the mission ahead. Hours upon hours of knowledge were processed within my mind in mere seconds. Every emotion I could feel wanted to burst out, but at the same time was pushed down by... Something as I stared blankly at the table. Gray stood to my side and placed his hand on my back. Take deep, slow breaths and push through it, he said in a comforting tone. I looked up at him and did as he told me. I focused my breathing as I closed my eyes. Five. Minutes passed, and the information flow abruptly stopped. I took a few more breaths and took a step back from the table. I looked up at Gray. If I were a Terran... I would be drenched in sweat right now. That was an experience I would not want to go through again, I said in a slightly sarcastic tone. Gray laughed at that comment. Don't worry, you will not have to go through that much of an information dump again, he said back. I could understand him now. I didn't need the translation device in my ear anymore, as I had the standard Terran language mapped in my brain. Feeling all right to get a bite, he asked after a moment. I would like that, yes, I feel like I could eat an elephant right now, I said back as an image of the Terran mammal seemed fitting as a reference. Gray chuckled at that remark. Well, let's hope you don't finish all the food in the mess hall, he commented back with a bit of an accent that I now knew was common among the people of the Trappist system. We exited the room and the wonders of the armory were at full display for me now. I knew many of the things they were working on here now. The guns, vehicles had names and purpose to them, and I understood what it was. Your technology truly is terrifying and beautiful, I said to Gray as I took in everything in a new light. It sure is, even I feel it can be overwhelming at times. 
Gray said back as we went to the exit. We walked towards the mess hall and I now felt weirdly at home. I chatted with Gray about his home and other small talk on the way as we met people, and I greeted them in Terran, which raised a few eyebrows in shock. We entered the mess hall and I got quite a few heads turning towards me as we walked in. It didn't deter me as we confidently walked to the buffet table. I felt pleased as I knew most of the things on offer as the menu was vast. It was getting close to evening, and I picked a hefty plate of chicken, rice, and vegetables. Damn, that is a lot of meat. Careful, that might be your long-lost relative you're gonna eat there, Zelios. Came a snarky remark from Gray behind me. My kind has eaten birds before. We are omnivores like you, but we prefer fish, and I'm craving protein right now. I snapped back in response with a huff. We sat down at an empty table and were joined by Lieutenant Kyle and the troops who came with us. They congratulated me on having gone through what they called the infamous neural blitzer unscathed, as many Terrans that go through the same process when they connect to their cotad become sick and puke or faint afterward. It seemed I gained some respect for my ordeal, and I happily consumed my dinner as I listened to stories about their lives and experience within Umbra. As I finished my meal, a voice I now knew chimed in my head. Commander Zalios, I request your presence in Hangar B-7. The officers that will serve under you will arrive in fourteen minutes, A.I. Hugin said in his bland voice. I looked at my device and saw a map with a guideline that depicted where I should go. I looked at Gray as he nodded with his head that I should head out. Best not keep him waiting. He gets quite frustrated when people are late, he said as he stood up with me. He placed his hand to his forehead as I imitated in kind. Good luck out there, Commander, he said with a smile. Same to you, Captain, I said in turn as I headed out of the mess hall. Well then, time to earn my keep, I thought to myself as I took a deep breath and headed towards the tram station.